Welcome back, everyone. Um, today, we're going to have an opportunity to talk about a wide range of historical and cultural forces that come together in the 1930s and define a new sense of American national identity. Um, and it's going to do that in the context of uh, an incredibly troubling and uh, trying era in history, not only for the United States, but for the whole world. And, um, but we're going to start by talking about the Tin Pan Alley tradition, which is a tradition of songwriting that's also sometimes been called the Great American Songbook. And we're going to explore how it grows from its, its beginnings in uh, the 19th century world of parlor song, a repertoire, a literature that we're already familiar with, uh, to uh, the grand and romantic uh, tradition of Broadway and the Hollywood musical that a lot of you uh, might be much more familiar with and which is the foundation uh, for so much of popular culture throughout the 20th century. Um, and in addition to that, uh, Tin Pan Alley is going to synthesize with African-American performance practice traditions like the blues and jazz, um, which we've been exploring in our previous lectures. And by putting these two things together, we're going to find uh, the evolution of something that really becomes the blueprint or the template for an almost universal notion of popular music and popular culture in the early to mid 20th century and beyond. Um, so why is it called Tin Pan Alley? Uh, it's called Tin Pan Alley because there's a place called Tin Pan Alley in New York City. Um, in the 1880s, the 28th Street region of New York City was the center for the, Euro for the European Jewish diaspora. Um, they were fleeing a, a virulent wave of anti-Semitism. And Jewish men in the 19th century um, you know, were often prevented from entering into a wide range of labor opportunities that would have uh, made them feel a more stable connection and footing in their environment in Europe, but they were, through anti-Semitism, prevented from participating in that. Um, as a result, um, you know, th they cultivated publishing and uh, industries that were, uh, uh, would eventually become the sort of defining features of the Jewish presence in the United States as uh, tradespeople of the press and of writing and of the arts. Uh, and there was a Christian mythology in, in Gentile Europe that exaggerated a kind of hatred of Jewish culture. And this was the, the world that constituted the traumatic displacement. When we talk about diaspora as a traumatic displacement or a traumatic dispersal of people. Um, so uh, they entered into all kinds of trades in the United States, publishing, clerical, entertainment, financial. Um, but American Jewish immigrant communities arrived with long experience in thinking about song and especially connected to Yiddish folk theater, made them a kind of um, a, a meeting point for a lot of different creative forces uh, among many different immigrant groups. So they weren't just representing themselves, they were representing a, a larger American experience. So music publishing firms sprang up along a stretch of West 28th Street known as Tin Pan Alley, which was a dense hub of small rooms with pianos where composers and song pluggers would promote new songs. And the density of that, the feeling of those pianos, like small rooms, very prosperous publishing firms. Uh, if you walked down that alley, you'd hear um, the musical ideas coinciding and overlapping in this, in this chaotic bricolage, and that's where it gets that clangy uh, quality that gave it the name Tin Pan Alley. Um, in our reading this week, um, Jeffrey Melnick's 2001 article, Tin Pan Alley in the Black Jewish Nation, we're going to learn about how the development of this, this publishing industry coincides with and co-influences the popularization of jazz. And I don't need to remind you that jazz is more than just a popular phenomenon, right? It's a, a, a kind of a sea change in the rhetoric uh, for what popular music can be and how musicians can relate to the world. Um, there's a lot more to be said about that article, for, but for right now and for purposes of our lecture, let me just make it clear. Um, we really need to understand that jazz is a performance practice and Tin Pan Alley is a songwriting practice. Of course, it can't always be quite that simple um, because certainly jazz musicians wrote songs, jazz musicians were composers, they were more than performers. Um, but the, what really defines and what really makes essentially the contribution to this union, to this synthesis, is the distinctive performance practices of jazz that we discussed 
um, in our last lecture, reinterpretation, layering of simultaneous perspectives and solos, the coming together of communities and call and responses of both unity and individuality, um, and these layers of rhythm. And this notion of reinterpreting a song spontaneously, um, this improvisation concept that allows us to express in real time how we are, who we are individually as musicians, that's a powerful template for what popular music can be, how it can express itself, what it can mean to much broader range of communities than just African Americans, and to combine that with a songwriting tradition that had become bigger than the Yiddish folk theater that influenced these songwriters um, is one of the things that we want to think about as we read that article. Um, so. Um, these, uh, these songwriters between 1925 and 1935, they create a golden age of popular song. I wish I had a couple of different lectures worth of time to explore so many different wonderful and distinctive, quirky, creative voices that participated in this tradition. Um, instead, we're gonna just talk about three defining forces. Uh, one of them, and sort of the undisputed father of the tradition is Irving Berlin. Um, born in the late 1880s, lived all the way to the late 1980s. Um, Irving Berlin um, inherits the parlor song tradition and um, gives it a multicultural characteristic. Um, he, he's a, a Jewish immigrant participating in this um, diasporic community that I described before, but he wrote songs that uh, became emblematic far beyond the Jewish diasporic community to which he belonged. They became a uh, deep part of the fabric of mainstream American experience and, and, and even of Christian American experience. Some of you know, uh, for example, the Christmas song, I'm Dreaming. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas Just like the ones I used to know Which uh, Bing Crosby made famous in uh, Holiday Inn. Uh, he also wrote uh, near anthem status for our uh, uh, patriotic uh, national culture, God Bless America. And uh, he wrote um, Cheek to Cheek, which Fred Astaire sings. Um, and I think maybe we have also a recording of Louis Armstrong in our unit uh, two listening lists. Um, so obviously really a foundational moment. George Gershwin, who I'll talk about in a minute, referred to um, Irving Berlin as the greatest songwriter who ever lived, and full stop, no qualifications, um, which is a great testimony from a songwriter that is beloved beyond measure. So another songwriter that is actually from the same generation as Irving Berlin, even a little bit older, um, but uh, who um, maybe got his start a little bit later is Jerome Kern, and I don't need to say too much about Jerome Kern because we've already studied his music. I've used his music so much as a, as a um, starting place for our conversations about pitch and rhythm and meter and form. So you heard me play, for example, in an earlier lecture, The Way You Look Tonight, um, and also um, All the Things You Are, and a little bit later I'll play um, a little excerpt from um, Old Man River, which is a song from Jerome Kern's uh, Showboat. And then finally we have George Gershwin. So Gershwin is known for songs like I've got rhythm, I've got music, I've got my love, who could ask for anything more? And um, uh, let's call the whole thing off, you say potato, I say potato. Um, made famous in a Louis Armstrong, Ella Fitzgerald duet. Um, and um, someone to watch over me. And Gershwin is also known for some contributions to American music that I guess are sometimes called serious music. That's a, a misnomer, but they aspired to a little bit more of a high art tradition. In Los Angeles, he was friends with the avant-garde composer Arnold Schoenberg. And he wrote in 1935, he wrote Porgy and Bess, which is a Broadway musical of sorts, but it's also really an opera. and. Uh, that's famous for uh, the song Summertime, which many of you may have heard in any number of versions, including Janis Joplin's. Um, and uh, a really, really famous piano concerto called Rhapsody in Blue all the way back in 1924. So Gershwin was trying to make 
um, the Tin Pan Alley tradition and trying to make the American music tradition into something that was classical in the European sense, in the, in the traditional, in the 19th century sense. So let me turn now um, to what I think is a great way of framing uh, the way that American culture evolved in the 1930s. Um, and it really comes down to a musical first made famous in 1927 that was a little bit ahead of its time. And uh, this is Jerome Kern's Showboat that I mentioned earlier. Um, it's a musical uh, about jazz. It's also about contrast between an old and a new America. It's based on a novel from just the year before by Edna Ferber. Um, Showboat is telling a story about a large riverboat, the, the kind with the paddle wheels in the back that, that doubles as a theater and tours the towns along the Mississippi River with a show. Um, and one of its themes was the moral scandal of miscegenation, of racial mixture, um, centered on a character who is referred to a term that we now consider dated and offensive and, and, and even meaningless, but the term mulatto to signify racial mixture. Showboat does have problems. The story seems to leave black characters in uh, positions of servitude and submission. Uh, and although um, Hammerstein intended that and, and Ferber intended that as a form of realism and critique, it's easy to see how audiences today uh, would look at this story and see its depiction and wonder um, if it makes the power differences between blacks and whites seem natural. Um, and one of the challenging things about the musical is that it was offensive to white audiences in at least two different and kind of contradictory ways. At the time, in the context of the Harlem Renaissance, a lot of progressive audiences really understandably wanted to see representations of black characters um, um, that fit different narratives. But at the same time, there was also a quality of pretension to the way that progressive audiences criticized the musical um, you kind of get a sense that they wanted to see African Americans as being civilized in a very specific way and that there was a Eurocentric, white-centric view of what that would mean. Um, other audiences were simply racist. Uh, many of them had never seen black and white actors on the same stage before and many in the South were offended by a storyline in which black laborers were treated poorly. Um, but looking back from our perspective, it's sometimes difficult to know uh, which is which. Were white uh, progressives advocating so-called positive images of black characters or did they simply want to erase the complexity of racial tension um, and whitewash the South making racism itself invisible. Um, I said before and emphasized that Ferber and Hammerstein um, were Jewish but another great author of Showboat was Paul Robeson um, and Robeson uh, loved this musical and was deeply proud of his depiction was one of the central characters involved in the, in the criticism that I described just a minute ago. Um, and Robeson would become known as a great leader uh, of the civil rights movement um, just a decade or so after his, his rose to fame depicting characters like this, um, both in opera and in uh, musicals. So one of the songs that Robeson sings in the musical is Old Man River. It's one of the most famous songs of the musical. And you can hear right away in the first couple of lines of the AABA form of Old Man River um, that the river uh, will help us to confront a sense of nature um, that I'll bring up again when I discuss Lawrence Levine's article, um, which is one of your elective readings for this unit. Um, but think about in these lyrics how Americans are relating to struggle, how Americans are relating to catastrophe and to um, what I think is particularly relevant for us today, relevant uh, in the sense that uh, a, a natural phenomenon can wreak havoc on our lives and really seems indifferent. Um, a sense of nature that seems, uh, it could take or leave humanity and that humanity's interests really aren't one and the same as nature's. Um, Robeson sings, old man river, that old man river, he must know something but don't say nothing, he just keeps rolling keeps on rolling along. Um, and then he talks about he doesn't do the labor that human beings do. And those of us who do that labor are soon forgotten. And Old Man River just keeps rolling along. Um, it sounds like this. Old Man River, that old man river, he must know something, but don't say nothing. He just keeps rolling. 
keeps on rolling along. So you can hear in this that this alternation between these chords makes it feel steady and constant. There's a kind of unchangingness between this sort of pairs of chords. Um, then and then it, it changes a little bit in the second A, and then that gladsome is soon forgotten. But old man river, he just keeps rolling along. And then the B section. You and me, we sweat and strain, bodies all aching and racked with pain. And then listen here, since this is the B section, listen to how the last line of it really fits that building of tension, that building of that bigger, more intense musical question that we've seen in previous B sections. Robeson sings, uh, Tote that barge, lift that bale, you get a little drunk, and you land in jail. I get so weary and sick of trying. I'm tired of living and scared of dying. But old man You know, this is especially gorgeous in a large and powerful and well-trained voice um, that I can only kind of aspire to. Um, but you can imagine that we start from a position that, as I said before, reflects the downtroddenness of a working class character. But the character is far more complex than the kind of primitivism um, uh, of which uh, the musical is sometimes accused. Um, and uh, in the sense that Robeson's character develops this philosophy for us um, in the context of an actual experience of labor, a real experience of work and struggle against a white oppressor. So I think this musical is a great um, sort of uh, foundation or a, a framework for us to think about arguments that Lawrence Levine makes in um, his article Culture of the 1930s. He asks, why in the Great Depression did Americans not experience uh, a spirit of rebellion? Why didn't this massive inequity um, yield a, a movement of a mass movement of protest, at least not an effective one? Um, there are progressive elements uh, like the great poet and Marxist writer Langston Hughes, whom we've already discussed as part of the Harlem Renaissance. There's Gene Autry, who at that time was a passionate voice for labor, along with Ernest Hemingway, Dorothy Day and others. They were all lionized. There was a sense that labor and labor unions and socialism are part of a mainstream ethos of an empowered America in the 1930s. Um, but Levine's article argues that this is mostly not really a revolutionary struggle. And the reason he says is that Americans saw their struggle as being not against the bosses and oligarchs who controlled wealth, but as being against poverty itself, or even maybe against nature. And the capacity of American culture to sort of channel uh, working class anger against these invisible and incalculable forces. Um, the broad abstract idea of poverty itself or of nature is one of the things that Levine really struggles with. And as we uh, embark in our own lives on what seems like the dawn of a new economic era and a lot of uncertainty, I think it's worth thinking about what Americans experienced as they made this transition into the 1930s. Um, before I close, just one last little point here. Um, uh, I want to just make sure we talk about how this framework of the 1930s becomes um, the, the ground, a kind of fertile garden in which swing music goes beyond its diasporic circumstances that we've discussed in a previous lecture. Uh, we also need to know about three really great musicians who made uh, really lasting impact on popular music through their participation in the New York swing scene. And um, those musicians are uh, first Cab Calloway, 
who in a movie in 1937, Reefer Madness, played a role in the, in the first sort of criminalization of marijuana by casting a kind of um, moral aspersion on it by associating it with, uh, with villainy and hoodlumism um, and associating it with swing, which increasingly moralized and intensified a kind of controversy that um, you'll see also in this week's readings in which swing becomes associated with moral downfall. Um, and uh, then you'll also want to know about the music of Chick Webb. Chick Webb's band is contrasted with Count Basie's band because Count Basie and Chick Webb played at this fabulous Savoy Ballroom in New York City. And they're famous for the kind of battles of the bands that um, uh, really were a kind of audience voice about what great music was. Uh, Count Basie, whose singer, uh, lead singer was Billie Holiday. Both of those are on your listening list this week. Um, against Chick Webb, whose lead singer was Ella Fitzgerald. And that contrast really shows you some marvelous dynamics between two different sides of what jazz can be. Holiday and Basie really being kind of rooted in the blues, along with saxophonist Lester Young, whose solos were just outrageous. And, uh, and, on the other, and, and rooted in a kind of power, a sense that the music could have a direct embodied feeling. And then in contrast to that, you'll see um, in that same article, Chick Webb associated with the more sophisticated high art vision of what uh, swing could be. And certainly Ella Fitzgerald as a singer embodies that contrast against Billie Holiday in some interesting sort of ways. And then finally, Duke Ellington. One thing to know about swing is that no individual really defines what swing is. No individual becomes the apex of the genre. If there was one who would become that apex, it would be Duke Ellington. The masterpieces of swing were the products of collaboration, and Duke Ellington is, is really the pinnacle of accomplishment in swing because of his tremendous gifts as a collaborator, because he understood the essential features of jazz were in this community, this sense of coming together um, that was really made manifest in his collaborations with um, uh, the gay songwriter Billy Strayhorn, who was kind of the composer, the mastermind arranger of the band, who transformed Duke Ellington's style. Ellington was also a tremendous composer. Um, Duke also uh, collaborated with Billie Holiday, just as Count Basie did. Soloists like Cootie Williams and Johnny Hodges. You don't need to know all these names, but, but Ellington's band was a collaboration of great individuals who knew how to work together. And his band was an opportunity to bring out this genius in other people and not just genius in himself. And, you know, we've talked before about how swing reaches a turning point in 1935. And these band leaders um, that I'm talking about uh, that were so important in the Savoy and in New York City that bring about what we call New York swing um, were just as big and just as important a part of that. Um, so it's not only Benny Goodman's um, Carnegie Hall concert that's discussed in Tempo of the Times, um, but it's the fact that he brings Fletcher Henderson's music to a national audience through the, the Let's Dance radio show. Um, which becomes a popularization of swing for much wider variety through radio, much wider variety of audiences and not just the urban audiences that had supported it before. Um, it's Cab Calloway popularizing the Hepster's Dictionary and popularizing a kind of a black vernacular for a wide range of American teenagers that should remind us of pop cultural phenomena that take place in the 60s and the 80s and in hip hop and in our own time. Um, and it's Fred Astaire movies like Top Hat and, and Swing Time that show um, a vision of a swing music that seems to be freed from diaspora. It seems to be freed from history and it seems to catapult um, this sophisticated music into almost a kind of a, a pristine heaven. And it's that idealism of those films that really starts to make um, the 1930s um, a kind of cultural experiment in which musics from all of these different places um, as far away as the Mississippi River uh, that Jerome Kern and Oscar Hammerstein drew inspiration from in writing Showboat um, to the diasporic experiences of Jews in Europe, bringing all of these things together into a world which, despite its complex history, becomes, um, at least in a fictional way, unified as a new America.